creation groans for the revealing of the sons of God. His holy invasion for a righteous revolution forged in his fire. Weaponized for warfare, roaring in his rest, and dancing in his reign. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cimarron Tribe. I'm Kelly Marie, and I'm so delighted that you are here joining me tonight. This is a tribe that honors and celebrates the wild nature of Jesus Christ. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, baby, and he is wild. And we celebrate the wild, pure nature of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. So let me tell you, if you are wild and you are tired of being confined with a religious system, a religious spirit, you have come to the right place because the Holy Spirit will dismantle every demonic influence off of your life, especially the Antichrist spirit that operates through a religious spirit in many Western culture churches. I praise God for those who are walking in right standing with the Holy Spirit, but here at the Cimarron tribe, we are are not enslaved. We are so radical. We are passionate. We are fueled with the passion of Christ. We are fueled with kingdom purpose. We are fueled and on fire and we burn for heaven's agenda. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, I didn't know the Lord was going to have me say that. But I'm saying it. So we're going to get started in about a few minutes, but I want to welcome all of you from my YouTube community and all of you from Facebook community, welcome. Please let me know where you're joining from. It is so cool when I get to see different nations that are led by the Holy Spirit here. So please let me know where you are joining from. And I wanna bless you and say, it's no coincidence that the Lord is leading you to come on tonight because we have a powerful Bible study, powerful teaching, along with such a word from God about radical obedience. And I am so stoked. <laughs> I'm so stoked because the Holy Spirit is stoking that fire within me to release this word. And listen, are you guys ready? Because I want to say this too, for those of you that might be new here to the Cimarron tribe, we do deep dives, okay? We dive deep. God has mantled me to give meat to the mantled and to really take you to deeper places in the heart of the Lord, to dive deeper into deep revelation, gaining deeper understanding of what the Spirit of God wants to cultivate in your life and bring forth such incredible breakthrough and harvest when your heart is in harmony with God's. So I want to say this again, when our hearts, including mine, when our hearts are in harmony with the Holy Spirit, when our hearts are in harmony with Christ, we experience amazing breakthrough and harvest when it's the right time and season. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Are you guys, oh my gosh. And also one other thing the Lord really wants me to say as well is if you have a wild heart and a wild spirit, you definitely want to subscribe to the Cimarron tribe, okay? So if you have not prayerfully considered joining this amazing community because you will be so incredibly impacted by the word of God and what the Holy Spirit ministers to all of us and what the Spirit of God serves all of us, including me, at the Father's table. Okay, let me say uh, some shout outs here. Hi, Brian, bless you. Is it, wait, wait to make sure. Oh, is it Tanel, Renell, Brenda? Hi, Deborah, Eddie, Erica, 
Praise God, Liz, Ashley, welcome you guys. We're gonna wait just a few more minutes. I'm going to put on some instrumental music and we're gonna dive in, guys. I'm so, so excited. Thank you, Lord. Okay, let's see here. Let me pull. This is a new instrumental piece and if you want to know where this is coming from, it is in the description of this broadcast. So here we go. Okay, here we go. Hallelujah. I hope you guys are having a beautiful week. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. I've got several things to talk about tonight. Praise the Lord. And I want to tell you that when I'm telling you and teaching you about radical obedience, you better believe that myself, that I have been instructed to recently step out and do something that required radical obedience. You know, when we minister the gospel, God begins to instruct, command us as ministers in the gospel to take action and do something specific that he wants to cultivate in us before he has us deliver it to you. And that is extremely important to know. That's what keeps us broken before the Lord, prostrate before the Lord. And how many of you really were deeply impacted by that deep word from God last week about what it means to be floored by the Lord, prostrate, spread eagle, in complete surrender to the timing and heaven's agenda in your life, in your walk with God, I was impacted. I was so impacted by that word and that teaching. It was so powerful. Whew. Blessings, Zach. Praise God. Welcome, Susan. Hey, Joyce. Thank you always, beautiful, for your prayers and intercession. I welcome, I embrace, I'm so thankful for those of you that truly pray, that truly intercede for the work of the Holy Spirit in me, for the ministry of the Lord in my life to truly deeply disciple. So thank you, thank you. I wanna just extend that from my heart. I just, I honor you guys and I thank you for those prayers. Thank you, Jesus. By the way, when I talk about intercession, I want you guys to know I am going to be revealing and announcing this week what is coming with my school of intercession, okay? It is called Naval Aviation Flight School, and it is going to be so powerful. It is all about bringing you into a life-changing season where you understand the depth and what is so dynamic about the kingdom cargo that you carry and how you are responsible to partner with the Holy Spirit in intercession. This school is going to impact your life in such a dynamic way. You are going to understand what it means to be in flight mode with the Lord. You are going to understand the difference between prayer and intercession. There is a major difference and it, God has put his burden in my heart to build this school that is going to absolutely equip you and empower you. You are going to gain deeper discernment. You are going to have great wisdom and revelation and understanding because of the fact that you're going to understand what it means to be completely in harmony with heaven, with the throne room of God, with the storehouse of heaven, because it is all about your heart posture. It is so important that people understand intercession is vital because it keeps you in harmony with the heart of God for your life. That you're not deceived because you're focusing on what your heart desires. 
And what happens is when we focus on what our own heart desires, we're not getting the strategy of heaven. We're not getting the plan of God because we're focused on our heart. Even when we want to pray for other people, we want the best for other people. What happens is if we're not postured in intercession, we're going to be a stumbling block in that person's life and their walk that is so detrimental. And we can become a spiritual dam if we're not careful because intercession aligns you with the heart of God, the timing of God, the plan of God. My Lord, I can dive deep right now, but I'm not going to finish because it is important and imperative that you step into the intercession school. And again, it's called Naval Aviation and it's not N-A-V. A L, it is N A V E L, which means out of the belly, out of the womb. Woo! I have been trained and I have walked through hell. I have walked through the valley of the shadow of death. I have went through unbelievable necessary storms to birth this school to the nations. It is not like any other school of intercession. This is going to be something captivating. This is going to absolutely set you on fire. It is going to take you out of spiritual fatigue into military fatigues. You're going to understand what it means to rule in Christ through the power of intercession versus being battle weary when you're just in prayer mode. Woo! So I'm just giving you guys a heads up. This is in the making and I'm going to be creating an actual page on my network where you can sign up ahead of time and get your heart ready because it is going to change your life. Okay, that's my, that's my purpose. And remember what God said? I'm done with the neighborhood in the church. I'm restoring my priesthood in the church. Hallelujah. Welcome, April and Sapphire and Kelly and Angela and Maureen. Welcome. Okay, we're going to get started. But as always, we're going to just honor the Lord. So you guys, we want our hearts postured to receive. So thank you, Heavenly Father. We bless you. We adore you. We are so undone by the way you strategically move in our lives. We want to honor you and thank you again for your grace and your mercy, your patience. We thank you that you are the essence of love, Christ, and your love is so patient with us. Hallelujah. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence, that you are here. You are the minister. You are going to teach. We're going to dive deep with you. So we just bless you. We thank you that over this broadcast, that you, Christ, the living word, you govern the atmosphere and you have slammed shut and sealed shut with the power of your blood, all demonic strongholds, all demonic interference, all demonic disturbance. It is disarmed and dismantled. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus, for every heart that you have sent here to receive and to feast on what you're discipling and what you are releasing to them at the Father's table. You always prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies, and we glorify you for that. When we are postured, resting in you, you are our resting place. And with every battle, when we're seated at your table, we embrace what is necessary to spiritually nurture and strengthen us, causing us to be completely discerning our spiritual eyes and our ears open from the words that you've spoken. And we are resting and praising you and celebrating you for you are the Lord. You are strong and mighty in battle. And we give you praise and glory that we are seated in heavenly places at your table, ready to eat ready to feast on what you're serving all of us in Jesus name. Woo. Okay, man. Hallelujah. So you guys, we're going to start out with what the Lord had me post. Okay. 
And I'm going to go here. Thank you, Jesus. When did I post this, Holy Spirit? I posted this, yep, yeah, five days ago. That's right. Okay. So the Lord had me post something really important. And I got definitely response from several of you on this post. It was direct confirmation from the Lord for you. And I want to read this again, okay? Because I want this to really go deep into your heart. The Lord said, there are specific desires in your heart that you don't think you have the strength to step into in this season. Because you think you're too old. Or you think too many years have gone by and you missed the boat. But the Lord says to you, it is not just a desire in your heart. It's what I am calling you to step out to do in my strength in this season. And you didn't miss the boat because I never called you to be in the boat. I called you to walk on the water with radical obedience unto me. And when we walk on the water, what are we doing? We are living by the Spirit. We are stepping out and we are taking action, responding to the voice of the Lord. Okay? Walking on the water is absolutely moving by the wind of the Holy Spirit, moving at the command of his voice. Hallelujah. So God is saying, when I ask you to do something, you better believe it will never be in your strength. If I ask you to do something, you're never going to be able to do it in your strength because I want all the glory. You're only going to be able to be fully dependent on my strength, on my revelation, on my wisdom, on my knowledge, on my direction, on my counsel. Woo, God. Okay, let me say that again. The Lord is saying, you're not too old. The plans I have for you that I decreed, oh yes, they will unfold at my command on my timing at the sound of my voice you are not too late because i've set a specific date for your kingdom purpose and your kingdom mandate and so again god has put a stirring okay not just in your hearts in my heart and i'm going to tell you what god told me to do okay so five days ago <laughs> Five days ago, I was in my bedroom. I was pulling out all my winter clothes to begin to put up, to, to, to put in my closet my spring and summer clothes. And as I was doing that, the Lord took me back 18 years ago. And in 2005, a very important time in my life, I had just been on a year's journey. I mean, walking on the water. You guys know that journey. I tell you about it. God told me to leave everything, get on a plane to go to Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. I had no clue what was going to happen when I landed off that plane. And everything was so supernatural. And by the Spirit of God, every detail of it, including the moment that I got on the shuttle bus and the Lord said, look outside and the name of the actual boulevard was esther boulevard esther boulevard and what's so important and so key about why god did that because when i was prophesied over and mantled by the holy spirit in 2002 a mighty woman of god looked into my face and said kelly God is going to birth a big ministry out of your life. The song of the Lord in you is your testimony and your intimacy with the Lord. But God is going to birth a ministry out of you that's going to go all over the world to the nations. And it's in your distant future. And the Lord says to you, daughter, 
He said, she said, God says you have the character of Esther. You have the character. Now I want to say something because this is really important. She didn't say to me, you have the Esther anointing because I teach this and some people don't get offended because I'm going to say it like it is. I'm blunt. I'm straightforward. I'm real. I don't sugarcoat anything. The only anointing there is, is Christ Jesus. He is the anointed one. Okay. Nobody went to the cross and shed their blood and died for you or me, but Jesus. So that is the anointing. That is the power from heaven that comes upon you. But Esther and Deborah and all those disciples, those chosen by God for their generation, you can have the character of them, but you don't have their anointing. I, 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 woo, okay. I just, I got to throw that in there. That's important. So again, God said, that, listen, I'm about to, woo, okay. Wow, we're going, so we're going to a deep place tonight. I'm, I'm excited. Do you hear me? You guys put a, you, I want you to comment in the chat because tonight you're going to participate, okay? Because we're going to really connect and get up close and personal because I know that several of you on here, you have amazing stories about what happened when you stepped out with radical obedience. When people thought you lost your mind, when people made fun of you, when people in the church the religious leaders told you that you were being rebellious, that God didn't tell you to do that. God didn't tell you to leave this ministry. God didn't tell you. When you stepped out in radical obedience and you experienced something so mighty and powerful that radically changed your life within, and you experienced something so amazing, I know you guys have amazing stories. So tonight... When I go deep talking about and teaching and discipling on radical, what radical obedience is all about, I want you, if you're led by the Spirit, to share something. Type it out in the comments, okay? And then, because this is a live chat, if you want later to go on the replay and then go in the comment section and type out something, I want you to do it. Because your story of radical obedience is going to fuel the fire in somebody else in this community. Whoo! Okay. So, God is saying in this season, I want you to hear this. God says, mark my words in the way that I've marked you. Because, baby, you are remarkable. God gave me this revelation a year ago, and he wants me to bring it back. I'll never forget when the Lord said, you're remarkable, meaning you're wonderful, you're amazing. I celebrate the way that I made you. I celebrate the way that I refined you for my glory. You are my radiant beauty. But God was also saying in the same breath, you're remarkable. Meaning if you backslid, if you fell, if you, you went in the wrong direction, if you got trapped because you were ambushed by the enemy and you, you, you felt like everything was over. No, God, God knows how to re-mark you where he says, on your mark, get set, go. <laughs> and, and, and when God marks you, it's a permanent marker. So just take that in, just take this in, you guys. God wants you to know the Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three and one, where every battle in our lives is already won. He wants you to know today you're remarkable. Whoo! Come on, you're remarkable. And it don't matter. It don't matter where you fell. It don't matter where you got derailed for a season or a certain time in your life. The moment that you come back to the Lord, you are remarkable. 
Is not that the story of the prodigal son? The son that left, that went into the world, and he came back thinking that he was going to lose his inheritance. He felt so broken and repentive. But what did the father do? He basically, in a nutshell, looked at his son with open arms and said, Son, you're remarkable. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. Hey! Come on, is somebody on here right now? God wants you to know that. You might have tripped, okay? You might have stumbled because you were going through so much pain. And that pain that you didn't lay at the feet of Jesus lured you by the voice of the enemy into something, right? You, you ended up doing something you know you shouldn't have done. But you were so consumed with pain and frustration and your emotions got the best of you. God is saying to you right now, I don't know who you are. And maybe you might not comment. That's okay. But it would be awesome if you did so I can see you and bless you. When you come back, you know what Jesus does? He literally washes and cleanses you of any of that unrighteousness. And he puts his fine linen back on you. He restores those heavenly garments. And he looks at you with so much compassion and so much love. And says, you're remarkable. Wow. Come on. He knows how he created you in his image. And he knows how rough it is out there in the world. And again, this is why the power of intercession is so vital because God is saying it to me again. If these teachers in the pulpit don't make intercession a priority, there is such a high percentage of those who backslide, those who walk away from God because they don't have what is so necessary to stay in tune and in harmony with the strategy, the plan of God and the heart of God for their lives. Come on, this is serious. This is so serious. Woo! Hey! Father, right now, I'm seeing comments. Thank you so much for being brave and courageous. Bless you. I decree now in Jesus' name, all condemnation, all guilt, and all shame is dismantled from your life. Dismantled from being attached to your soul. In Jesus' name, you are remarkable. In one moment that you surrender and you come back to the Lord and say, man, I, I screwed up. You know what? You guys are going to laugh, but I'm going to tell you. God literally put a vision in front of me for someone I was ministering to uh, months ago. And he showed me a screwdriver. Okay, this is going to bless you. He showed me a screwdriver in a vision. I was like, what in the world, Lord? And the Holy Spirit smiled and said, what happens is, even when you screw up, when you come back to me, okay, I will fill your cup. Like David said, Lord, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Why? Because you anoint my head with oil to make my cup runneth over. I need your anointing. I need you, Jesus, to walk upright in righteousness. So what happened is the Lord said, when you screw up and you come on to me and you surrender, I'll make you a screw driver. You will be a tool in my hand that begins to fix things. Y'all, that, that was the, that was so awesome. I was like, Holy Spirit, that is like what? And it was such a profound revelation he said so 
you might screw up. You're going to screw up at times. Yeah, you are. But when you come back to me and you, you truly repent and you say, man, God, I don't know what the heck, what was I thinking? God will give you understanding of what is the real reason you screwed up. Okay. And then when you submit to him, right, submit unto the Lord, surrender, and then you can resist the devil. So you become a screwdriver, which means you become a tool that is vital in someone's life. I love that. See, so say, I once was a screw up and now I'm the Lord's screwdriver. I mean, when something's loose, right? If you try to put something together and it's not screwed in tight, it can fall apart. This is such a good one. This is so good. I love you, Holy Spirit. Told you we're going to go to a deep place about radical obedience here tonight. So say, I know how many times I screwed up in that area of my life, but you know what? God made me a screwdriver in that area of my life. Now I am a, a vital tool in his hands. <laughs> Man, somebody need to hear that tonight. You're remarkable. You are remarkable. Come on, just say, I am remarkable to God because he said so. I'm remarkable. Even when I screw up, when I come with a heart of repentance, I'm remarkable. Okay. Man, that's so good. All right, I'll, I'll let that sit in your spirit. Come on, soak that up. Just soak it up. Woo! Soak it up. I'm a, I'm a screwdriver. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to dive in here. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So I'm going to go back to my story now because the Lord kind of shifted that moment. Praise God. We want to just yield to you, Lord. We love you. So here I was transitioning, right? Winter clothes, putting my spring and summer clothes in the closet. And God reminds me of what I did in 2005 that was so wildly radical, okay? 18 years ago. And what he called me to do was he called me to go on a water fast for 40 days. There is no way, no way that I could have done that without the strength of the Lord. There was a purpose in that water fast in my life. God was doing something in me in that water fast, which was putting his burden, mantling me with his burden to intercede and travail for nations. I'll never forget it. And at that time, some of you remember, Melody Morris is my mama bearer. And I actually lived with her for a season after I came back from Texas, right? Where I said, God said, look, and it was Esther Boulevard. And it was, it was wild what God did in my life where the angels of the Lord were in the airport and began to prophesy and laugh hysterically knowing what God was doing in my life. And I'll never forget one of the angels because they were in human form. God speaks about this. And one of the angels said, it's one thing to talk about faith and it's another to walk in faith. And you are walking an Abraham walk of faith with the Lord. I'll never forget it. So after this year of my journey, and some of you need to hear this, people in the church were persecuting me because they thought everything I did was a waste of time and they had no idea the heavenly encounters that I had with Jesus himself that was so absolutely mind-blowing in my life. A year of my life. The unbelievable restoration and things that happened inside of me 
in my spirit man and even my own family they persecuted me they said you how in the world could you be favored by God look at you don't have anything and they had no idea that I radically obeyed the Lord to leave everything to understand how I was being mantled with the burden of the Lord to be a handmaiden of God to intercede for nations. Come on, I can feel you guys right now. I know there are those of you on here, you're going to say, oh my God, the Lord did that in my life. Oh my goodness, Kelly, God did that in my life. It didn't seem like anything was growing or flourishing on the outside, but everything was happening on the inside of me. Whew. So here I was on this water fast and I did it. Oh my goodness. It was so hilarious that during that time, I was watching cooking shows, learning about recipes and everything while I was just fasting and drinking water. I was so disconnected from my flesh. It was the most powerful moment. And even God is saying now, when you respond to me and you step out in radical obedience, fully surrendered, fully dependent on my strength, on me alone. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. You will be completely disconnected from your flesh. You will be so you will be so in your spirit. You will be so detached from everything in the world, everything out of, even in your soulless realm. You will be so one in the spiritual realm with God. It is that powerful what I'm saying to you. So God was having me travailing and interceding for nations. He was preparing me for ministry when I didn't even realize what was what was getting ready to happen in my life. But he marked me to be a woman of great faith because my assignment in the earth was to release a fire from heaven that would awaken reignite the embers in the hearts of his people to become a holy flame to burn again with radical faith such a strong faith that even your own thoughts and your own insecurities could not be a voice of opposition well let me say that again such a radical faith that even your own thoughts, your own insecurities could not be a voice of, of opposition to dismantle that faith, to step in radical obedience. And I decree tonight with the authority of Christ that several of you on here are about to see the ember in your spirit man become a burning holy flame in the power of Christ's name. You are going to literally feel like your bones are on fire. You're going to be excited. The oil of joy is going to saturate you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And you are not your human spirit is not going to talk you out of what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. Your human spirit is not going to be a voice of opposition. And the opinion of man is not going to be a voice of opposition. In the name of Jesus, I'm decreeing tonight that as we dive deep into radical obedience, we go into the Word of God. God is going to move on you in such a powerful way tonight that you are going to be so surprised at how you respond to the voice of God. You're not, the voice of fear is going to be disarmed. You're not going to be intimidated anymore. You're not going to listen to the lies of the enemy anymore. Because when your heart posture is right, 
You will take flight in the spirit. And I feel the Lord wanting me to say this. Do you know why the Lord causes us to really have faith? God wants us to have strong faith because it takes strong faith to walk in radical obedience that impacts the lives of so many others around you. That it's vital. They're in a critical condition. They're in a serious condition. God is not going to tell you to walk in radical obedience if it's not vital for your life or the lives of other people. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So guess what? I'm on day five. I submitted to God. I said, Lord... I can't do this in my own strength. I thank you that you are filling me up with the strength that you are. And you are giving me so much joy in this process. Do you know why God asked me to go on this serious water fast 18 years later? Because this school of intercession is serious. You hear me? My act of radical obedience is to deeply disciple and to restore intercession in the church. My God, your radical act of obedience is for something very important. Here we go. You guys ready? Radical obedience is when you are stepping out to take immediate action at the command of the Lord in a life-changing situation, in a vital situation. It is never comfortable. It often requires sacrifice and great faith You and surrender. Radical obedience is when you are literally fully dependent on the strength of Christ and the boldness of Christ himself to fulfill your task. Woo! And I can feel the Holy Ghost moving right now. You have to understand, some of you, I can feel God right now igniting a fresh hunger. Igniting a fresh hunger. I can sense stuff going on in minds right now. And God is releasing his peace and his stillness over you as you are hearing this word. And I want you to say this with me. My act of radical obedience is never comfortable. It requires sacrifice on my part. Great faith and surrender to Christ, my Lord, my King, my Commander, my Savior, my Healer, my Provider, my everything. And with my act of radical obedience, I am fully dependent on the strength of my King, on the strength of my Redeemer, the strength of my Lord, my Savior, the love of my life, on his boldness, on his strength. The Lord is strong and mighty. But I am fully dependent on Christ alone to fulfill my kingdom task, my assignment. Because I have to understand the only reason God is calling me to radical obedience is because it is vital in my life and in the lives of others. Destiny demands. Come on, I want you to say this with me. My destiny demands sacrifice. My destiny demands discipline. My destiny 
is vital for the sake of the lives of others. And your destiny is your calling. We are done with the apostate church. We are done. Are you done with the apostate church that wants you to be so in your soulish realm when it comes to your calling in Christ? They want you to focus on money and the relationships you desire and the dreams that you, all the stuff that you want. We're done with that. We understand to follow Christ. There is great responsibility, but my God is there great reward when we see the lives of others that have been in chains of slavery get liberated because of our obedience. All the other stuff in this natural realm, yeah, those things come. But to be frank about it and to be blunt about it, we really don't care about that stuff. We're created in the image of Christ. The truth is that our heart desires to see others liberated the way that God liberates us. That's the greatest reward. That's the greatest harvest. Your destiny is all about being a part of something greater than you. I want you right now, and then we're going to dive in. We're going to keep going because I'm going to, I'm going to break down scripture tonight. We're going to go into these amazing men and women of God who had to step out with radical obedience because their radical obedience changed a nation. Their radical obedience shifted the direction and the culture of a nation. My God. I want you to take a moment. Everybody with me right now. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to visualize thousands of people in thick chains. Chains around their neck, around their ankles, around their wrists. I want you to envision these people. I want you to see children. Little children. I want you to visualize the women and the men and the babies in chains, human trafficked, sexually trafficked. I want you to see and visualize people in chains. And some of them are in these chains because those chains of slavery is sin. And others, these chains are because they are victims. They're kidnapped. They're taken against their will. Do you know that the definition of slavery is actually one who overpowers you and takes you against your will? It is nobody's will to live a sinful life. But when they're deceived and they experience pain and suffering, Satan will lure them into sin. It is not the will of a person to just sin. Slavery is when something overpowers you and takes you against your will. Now, how many of you can literally visualize tons of people in front of you? How many of you could literally see an image of tons of people in front of you in these shackles and chains? They're in pain. They're starving. They're malnourished. They're weak. And I want you, 
I want you guys to comment. But now I want to tell you this. There are those people. They are waiting for the spirit of Christ within you. To step out in radical obedience. Because your radical obedience is going to save the lives of others. And that's what you have to realize. The calling of Christ is never about what you get to receive. Financial breakthrough, all these things in your personal life. That's not what the calling is about. And I'm, I'm preaching with holy boldness and I'm speaking the truth. And I'm not fearful and I'm not concerned of people who get offended. Because our flesh is always offended when truth is spoken. I know when I got offended, my flesh got offended when truth was spoken. So I'm no different. But I'm telling you right now. When you answer the call of God in your life, it is separate from your personal life, meaning everything that you want and you desire. Your calling is about following Christ so that you see Christ in you, the hope of glory, break the chains and rescue those that are held against their will. And when we obey the Lord, we have a loving Father that loves to shower us with gifts. He loves to bless us. But the reason so many run from their calling is because they attach their personal desires with their calling. I know this is speaking volumes to some of you out here right now. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Spirit heavy on this. And I was not prepared. I had no idea the Lord was going to talk about this right now. My God. This is going to change your whole paradigm. When it comes to your calling. Your calling? The ecclesia? The remnant of God? Your calling is focused on. On discipling, of, making, preach my gospel and make disciples. How is that? Because my spirit upon you is going to go and liberate those held in slavery. Woo! God is going to deal with these hireling shepherds. And these people that prostitute prophecy and do not separate your personal life from your calling. Please share this. I don't ask, I don't ask, I'm asking you guys right now to tag people. If you're on Facebook, start tagging people. They need to hear this word. There are, there are people that need to, this is a serious word from God. You will experience so much freedom and joy when you separate your personal life from your calling. That you understand my calling is not to get all this stuff from God. My calling is to have eyes like a dove, focus like flint on those that Christ wants to liberate from slavery. Do you hear me? That is what the calling of Christ is only about. Nothing else. Nothing else. Woo! This is burning in my belly right now. This is true discipleship. No more about always focusing on, Paul, oh, you get your breakthrough and let me tell you how you're going to get your breakthrough and get all these things. No. <sighs> 
God will bless you because you become a burden bearer for the kingdom. He will shower you supernaturally. And you guys know all about those who absolutely love Jesus and you understand. Okay, here we go. Praise God. So radical obedience is literally, you are fully dependent. There, you can do nothing but fully depend on the strength of Christ, on the direction of the Lord. This is a, a, a serious, it's like when you see the movie slate where the Holy Spirit says, action. Radical obedience is when you have to act immediately. It's not something that you just think about and you put aside. Radical obedience is when God requires your yes in that very moment he speaks to you. Okay. Hallelujah. Now there's something. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to wait just a minute because we just went a whole direction with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I mean, that is such a... That is such a serious word. Because oftentimes what happens is, I've done it. I remember the times that I wanted to attach my personal life with my calling in Christ. And what happened is I was easily swayed by the enemy to become angry at God. To become angry at God. And to go into this unbelievable turmoil of a twister. Satan is a tornado. He is a twister. He will twist the truth. Put you in a whirlwind of chaos to mix truth with your reality. And cause you to want to go into a deep depression and get angry at God and the reason God doesn't get angry when we get angry at him because he knows the tactic of the enemy he knows it and he comes with love but he brings you back to the place that you need to separate your personal life from what your calling is in the kingdom Woo! okay so, okay, Holy Spirit, have your way. Here we go. The Lord wanted me to discuss how the voice of fear, which is Satan himself, okay? But when God commands something, okay? When he, when he says, I need you to do this and I need you to do it now. The voice of fear will want to automatically intimidate you want to cause you to go into your insecurities, into your soul. And he'll want you to feel that you're not worthy. You're not equipped. You're making a mistake. You're wasting your time. He'll all, he'll want to spew all this over you when God, or saying, you know, you don't need to do that right now. I know, you know, that he's saying that, but, but you know, that's not really important. You know, you, you don't really need to do that. That's, so I'm telling you, the voice of fear will want to speak into your ear to talk you out of taking immediate action. And I'm going to say this in the name of Jesus. I dismantle and disarm that voice of fear that wants to speak into your ear to talk you out of what God is saying and commanding you to take action to do in this season of your life. Whatever God has told you to do, 
And I'm, some of you, yes, Lord, some of you, God is telling you to take radical action, meaning radical obedience, step out to build. God is calling some of you on here and those of you on the replay, God has told you to build in this season. So that the voice of fear is going to want to make you feel that you're not worthy, you're not ready, you're not good enough, you need to... You, you, you're, you, you can't do all that right now. You know, I'm going to tell you right now. God is calling. I want to, I want you to do this. If God is calling you to build something, to launch something in this season that is greater than you, I want you to type in the comments, build. I want you to type build. If the Lord, you are a leader God has called you in this season. He gave you a blueprint. He made you wait because he had to strengthen your roots. All right. If God has called you to build in this season, right now, I disarm and dismantle the voice of fear. And I release the voice of faith. I thank you, Lord, that your voice of love and your voice of truth you are the voice of love and the voice of truth. And I thank you that you are speaking into their ear and you're bringing them joy and excitement and you're fueling their faith to absolutely quickly and immediately respond. Hallelujah. I heard that so clear in the spirit. God has called me to build as well. So I had to take radical obedience. And I did. And I'm doing it. But it's my responsibility to call it out in your life too. Because what you're called to build is bigger than you. It's going to, it's going to impact other lives. It's going to, to literally change the course and the direction of someone else's life you have no idea when god tells you to build something it is absolutely bigger than you okay here we go now i'm going to talk about something really important then we're going to dive into abraham we're going to dive into Joseph, Moses, Peter, and Esther. But I want to say something right now for those of you that are on that you might have to jump off and come back on the replay. I'm going to go here because I feel the Holy Spirit on this. Okay. I'm about to talk about the one who stepped out with the greatest act of radical obedience in just a minute. Some of you already know who that person is. But what I want to say is, there are those times when a radical act of obedience, you're in a grocery store, you're in a business, you're at a gas station, or you're at a ministry gathering, wherever you are, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you hear the Holy Spirit whisper in your ear, put a vision before you and tell you to immediately step out and go speak to this person. Okay, we're going to talk about radical obedience. I'm going to tell you a story in just a minute. But I want to say this. This is very important. When you step out in radical obedience, you are to only release whatever the Lord is telling you to, and then you stop. Most people that step out in radical obedience, they can share what the Lord is saying, but then they add to it and they make a mess. Meaning this. God may have you. You're out and about. 
And God may say, I need you to speak to this person. And you speak to that person, but then you think you need to invite them to your church. You need to start preaching to them. And God didn't tell you to do that. That's what a religious leader will tell you to do. So I want to pray in the name of Jesus that if maybe you're the one that may struggle with that because you step out and you, you minister, but then you, you keep going and then you feel something off and then you feel like, oh man, I, you feel condemned because you don't think you did enough or you're supposed to save that person. You're not their savior, number one. And the only responsibility you have is to respond to only what God is telling you to say. And then you go on your way. Okay, this is... I'm going to turn this down for a minute. How many of you on here... God's going to go here, then we're going to go... We're going we're gonna to dive into the scripture. How many of you on here have ever experienced witnessing somebody doing this, right? And this is all learning. We're, we're learning, right? We're growing. We make mistakes. But how many of you, if it was you or somebody else where God tells you to do something and then the Spirit of God lifts, right? The Holy Spirit's done. But then all of a sudden that person now goes into their own soul, into their own mindset and they think that they have a responsibility to like preach to that person or invite them to their ministry, this kind of thing. And you felt it. You're like, wait, something's not right. Okay. Or maybe somebody tried to tell you that, that you need to, you need to invite them to the church. You need to, you know, you need to, you need to preach to them. You need to give them scriptures and da, 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 da. I'm telling you. A lot of people have good intentions, but then they cause problems because God does not want you to do anything that is outside of what he tells you to do. Okay, okay, I'm seeing it. It happened to me. Okay. When you were new, okay. Because you know what? And listen... We've all done it. We've all done it, right? Where we're just, we're so zealous. We're, we're, we're so excited, right? But God wants me to teach on this for a minute because it breaks off false responsibility. Whenever you're called to evangelize, right? To go out there on the streets or wherever and the Holy Spirit's leading you and it's a beautiful moment. But it's, we have to, we have to make sure, right? So if you're that person and you love to reach out to people and, you know, always want to pray and say, Holy Spirit, whenever you lead me to a person that you want to speak to, hold my tongue when you're done. Hold my tongue. Stop me when you're done ministering so that I can honor what you've released and that I do not feel responsible for anything else in that person's life because you're responsible for them. Okay? So I feel like that's important. When we step out in radical obedience, it's incredible. It is incredible. For instance, let me share this with you guys. Let me look at our timing. Okay, it's 6.05. Okay, we're doing great. Okay. Because you know, we have, a, we have a whole, we're getting ready to dive into the scripture. But I want to tell you again, so you guys remember when I did the hair salon thing, right? So, but the other day, God told me to get my nails. I had to fill my nails and he wanted me to get a pedicure. And I was like, and I never do this stuff. It's like, I hardly, maybe once in a blue moon. So I went yesterday. And I go to the salon and the lady says, we're going to do a pedicure first. And so I sit down and I'm getting a pedicure and this lady walks in and sits right next to me. And she tells the other lady that's going to give her a pedicure. She's like, you know, I only want to do this. 
I don't want you to um, I don't want you to scrub my legs and, and and I don't want anything I just I just want you to just wash my feet and put some oil on it and the lady who was doing the pedicure she goes oh is there a specific reason and the lady says well I have cancer and immediately the Holy Spirit begins to rise up within me okay not my flesh and I'm quiet and the lady next to me, she's explaining that she's had cancer for seven years, that they had to take it out of her stomach, but there were a couple spots in her liver. And as she's sitting there, I'm listening, all right? Because we're going to talk about obedience means listen. So I'm listening and I'm, you know, where I'm at. And all of a sudden, the Lord tells me, to tell her about my best friend who had cancer and that Jesus absolutely healed her. That her story is amazing, right? So God tells me just to do that. So I was obedient and I looked at her and I said, you know, I said, I just want to tell you that I have such compassion because one of my closest best friends was diagnosed with cancer a few years ago and I said you know she stood in faith and she has a beautiful relationship with the Lord and she believed that the Lord would heal her that Jesus is still a healer and I told her my best friend's story and the lady looks at me and she goes you know she goes I believe that God does that and so all I did was I smiled at her and I said I'm going to extend my faith with your faith and believe with you that the Lord is going to take that, those spots out of your liver and that he will heal you and he will be glorified. And she ends up saying, amen. And that was it. We we're getting our pedicures. And all of a sudden, when she leaves, the lady that was doing the pedicure she looks at me and she says, she looks at me and she says, whispering, she says, I'm a Christian and she's Vietnamese and she's an adorable lady. And I said, oh, that's so beautiful. And God opened the door for me to talk about how amazing Jesus is. And begin to speak about something beautiful about Passover. We're having a loud conversation in the entire salon. And the Lord is being glorified. Why? Because all I did was simply speak one thing to the one lady. And then I was quiet. I didn't say, can I, can I pray for you? Can I, can, can I pray over you? No, I didn't do nothing. I just encourage, all the Lord wanted me to do was encourage her and share about my best friend's experience. That's it. But the Lord touched that lady that was working in that salon and she began to open her heart. And she said, you know, it really touched my heart the way that you spoke to this lady because she hasn't come in here for two years. Her husband passed away, her mother passed away, it's her first time coming back in, in two years. And it encouraged her to be able to express her heart and her love for Jesus. Okay, so that, but God opened the door to just, I mean, change the whole atmosphere in that salon and release so much joy. And I got to share stories with these beautiful women from Vietnam. It was amazing. Okay. Hallelujah. Again, you only do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do and then you're done. That's it. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. I'll tell you one more story. I, I got to be obedient. I know you guys are ready to dive into the scripture, but I'm, I got to tell you one more story and then we're going in. We're, I promise we're going in. This other story 
is a moment that I set my alarm to go to work, okay, and my alarm didn't go off. And I woke up and I was late for work and I went, oh my gosh. I was like, Lord, I slept in. I'm late for work. And the Lord speaks into my ear and he says, daughter, you're on my time. You're on my time. And all of a sudden, right, I, I literally remember this moment because I called work. I was a caregiver and I called work and I said, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And they said, you know what? If you didn't show up for work on time, we have a policy that we have to, we have to terminate you, you know? And I was like, oh my goodness. And so I hang up the phone. The Lord speaks to me and says, daughter, go to, to that, go to work. You're going to work. Get on the bus and go there anyway. And I was like, what? So I go to the bus stop. And I'm standing at the bus stop. And as I'm walking to the bus stop, there's a lady. She looks like she's in her mid-30s. Because this was in 2002. Or no, 2003, excuse me. And she's standing at the bus stop. And the Lord speaks to me. And says, I want you to tell her. That in the midst of this storm that she's in right now. I am with her. And everything is going to be okay. Now, you think, like, she's a total stranger. Like, what in the world? She got to think I'm crazy. And all of a sudden, how I did it. I said, hello, good morning. And she says, oh, hi. And I said, I know this might sound strange. But I have a personal relationship with the Lord, with Jesus. And I have to obey him right now. And I have to tell you that in the midst of the storm that you're in, he says in the midst of this unbelievable storm that you're in right now, he is with you and it's going to be okay. And that woman has tears coming down her eyes and she's weeping and she looks at me and she said, my children were just taken away from me last night. They were taken from me. And I'm devastated and I'm heartbroken. And she's weeping profusely. Why? Because God made me miss getting up on that alarm because there was an alarm going off in heaven. And God wanted me to be there in that moment to deliver a message to this broken mother. But it gets better. That moment happens. See, when we have radical obedience, God blesses us. So I did what God told me to do. I blessed her. I asked her if I could give her a hug. It was a beautiful moment I'll never forget. And I got on the bus. And I go to work knowing I'm fired, okay? I get on the bus. I go there. And the lady says, Kelly, you're an outstanding caregiver. But, you know, it's just policy. But, oh, by the way, we have your check. And she hands me the check. And immediately the Lord says, there's your rent money and your groceries. Because... I had to wait. I had to pay my rent, but I had to wait two weeks for my paycheck and I didn't have anything in my refrigerator. God, God takes the foolish things to confound the wise. My radical obedience ministered to a beautiful mother who is distraught. God made me miss my alarm. He made the alarm he not go off. So I could be there in that moment. And because I obeyed the Lord, God blessed me and said, here's your provision. And then he sent me on another bus and he opened up a door to give me a raise with a different job. Radical obedience. Come on, 
some of you got stories. Please share it in the comments or, or on the replay. Go in the comment section and share a radical obedient story, okay? I know you guys got amazing stories and I want to hear them. Or email me and share your story. I mean, seriously, I love, I love to hear stories about radical obedience and what takes place when you obey the Lord, when you do it immediately. Now we're going to go into this. You guys, this, this from the Holy Spirit wrecked me. Okay. This wrecked me. The greatest radical act of obedience came from our creator himself. I'm going to say it again. The greatest radical act of obedience came from our creator, Jesus himself. When God the Son came in the form of man and gave his own life into the hands of his own enemy, to rescue all humanity from the slavery of sin. He laid down his power and authority to destroy his enemy. He laid it down when he shed his blood for us. But listen to this. This rocked my world. The Lord said this to me. He said, Satan thought he took the Lord's power from him but had no clue that Jesus was actually walking in the greatest power. And the Lord said, the greatest power is surrender. Surrender. Jesus surrendered. He laid down his power and authority to, I mean, pulverize and annihilate his enemy. He laid it down to actually walk in something more powerful, which was surrendering what was what? Something greater for something greater. And that was to bring his creation back into the Father's formation. There is no greater act of radical obedience then surrender. Surrendering your own agenda for heaven's agenda. Surrendering to truly embrace what is greater than you a greater purpose, a greater dream than your own personal dream. I remember the day that the Lord spoke and said, Kelly, you're not the only one that has a dream. My dream is that none should perish, but have everlasting life. And I'm going to birth my dream through you. But is this not powerful? I mean, the Lord literally said, Satan, Satan thought he stripped me of all my power. But he was so clueless because he didn't recognize that something was more powerful than destroying the enemy, which was surrendering my authority to do so, so that I could rescue humanity. Radical obedience is all about releasing the power to surrender, to surrender to the plan of God, the strategy of God that comes straight from heaven. Radical obedience is to surrender to the command and instruction of the Lord, even when it doesn't make sense.
Radical obedience is the power to surrender to something greater than you that liberates a people or a nation from the chains of slavery. Radical obedience is to, to surrender to what? To what is greater than you that advances the kingdom. That actually takes others to a deeper place with Christ. Okay, now what we're going to do, we are going to dive in, okay? Because this is powerful. Radical obedience from Abraham shifted and changed the history of nations. When Abraham was commanded by God to put Isaac, the very son that God promised Abraham and Sarah. When God told Abraham, and listen, we're going to read, because it was, it was a quick moment. It was like an act of radical obedience. And we're going to talk about this because this is deep. We're going to go to Genesis 22, verse 2, and Genesis 22, verse 15 through 18. Because Genesis 22, 2, you know when everybody sees 2, 2, 2, you're getting a whole nother revelation. You're going to see it in a whole nother light now because everybody sees 2, 2, 2 and thinks it's about kingdom marriage alone or thinks it's about um, some other things. But I'm going to tell you, here's a whole nother revelation about two, two, two. And we're diving in now. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Hallelujah. We're going there. Genesis 22. This is going to be so good tonight, guys. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. It says, And God said, to Abraham, take now your son, your only son Isaac, who you love, and get into the land of Morai and offer him as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I tell you. Okay, now I'm going to go to a different translation because I want uh, that one kind of. Uh. All right, let's see. Here we go. Okay, well, okay, it's the same thing. <laughs> right, okay. So God is saying to Abraham, but he says, get your son right now, go take him, and put him on the altar, and sacrifice him as a burnt offering unto me. Okay? Abraham responded immediately. There was a radical act of obedience, and what we're going to see, we're going to go to Genesis 22 chapter 22 verse 15 through 18 now what happened because he was obedient to do what god told him to do as we know we know that it was about abraham discovering how much he truly trusted and loved god with all of his heart he didn't fight god he obeyed god radical obedience because he trusted the Lord. Okay. Listen to this. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Oh my God! And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. This is going to get meaty right here. I want to read this again. 
What is God saying to us when we step out and immediately obey the Lord, even when it's uncomfortable, it looks foolish, but God is saying to act now. That's radical obedience. So the angel of the Lord stops Abraham from killing his own son, sacrificing his own son, and says, I swear, in other words, he said, I promise by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have obeyed me, in other words, you stepped out in radical obedience, you did not withhold your son, you trusted me. Now, guess what? In other words, God's saying, because you trust me, because you trusted me, now I can entrust you with an inheritance. Woo! Y'all hear me? When we act in radical obedience, it shows God that we trust him. Oh, Jesus. Woo! It shows the Lord that we trust him. And in response to our radical obedience, God says, now I can entrust you. I can entrust you with an increase. I can entrust you with the people. I can entrust you. I'm going to bless you because I know that you trust me. Listen to what God says. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Now I want you to take hold of this next verse. Your descendants will take possession of cities, of the cities of their enemies. When you step out with radical obedience, God will give you land, territory that was once occupied and governed by the enemy. It's in the word. What did God tell Abraham? Your, your, your descendants... And we're the descendants of Abraham. We're included in that. Your descendants are going to take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all the nations on the earth will be blessed. You got to you got to really take a hold of this. Abraham's radical act of obedience opened the heavens to literally change the course of history of to the nations i mean my god out of abraham here's isaac isaac jacob oh jesus out of jacob's uh, lawrence joseph oh, okay can we can we go deep are you guys ready to dive with me because of abraham's radical obedience Joseph would have never been, oh, okay. Joseph positioned before the Pharaoh to govern a nation that he was once enslaved in. He was able to do what? What God said to Abraham generations past. Your descendants will take possession, oh my God, of, look, of cities of their enemies or even nations and through your offspring all nations on the earth are going to be blessed. Out of Abraham's loins, God opened the heavens to make sure from that generation to the next generation this was going to take place and he spoke it and prophesied it. He didn't just prophesy it. He promised. Y 
your radical obedience unto God is far deeper than you realize. Your sacrifice, the fruit of long suffering, what you do with radical obedience, the impact, it's a deep impact, it's far deeper than you can comprehend. But I want you to take it in right now. Just this, we're, we're just talking about Abraham. But look what God did because you obeyed. You immediately responded to me. Now I'm going to entrust you. I'm going to bless your descendants. Oh my God. So we can say in teaching and discipling, we see what took place with Abraham's radical act of obedience. Here we go. We're going to go to Joseph now. When Joseph interpreted the dream of the butler and the baker when he was still confined in a prison. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 40 and then Genesis 41 verse 1 through 39. So Genesis chapter 40, I'm going to read that scripture. And then basically in Genesis, this is the moment that the butler finally has to speak up because he forgot about Joseph. But wait, did he forget about Joseph? I don't think so. God allowed that on purpose because he wanted to make sure the butler spoke of Joseph at the right time. Oh my goodness. Sometimes we think, oh my goodness, everything I poured out, everything I did in obedience, how come, how come the people haven't honored? How come they haven't spoke up? How, how come they haven't, you know, recognized? How come they haven't been a part of helping me move forward and, and advancing? And look at, we're going to talk about this because that butler, Joseph told him, hey, don't forget about me. Tell, you know, tell the Pharaoh. And the butler, the butler did it. He forgot. But I, I'm telling you, I believe God made him forget on purpose for the right appointed time the right appointed time when God would release those dreams to the Pharaoh listen to this here we go thank you Jesus we'll go to Genesis chapter 40 that's why I tell you when God tells you to say something and then you just stop you do what God tells you to do. Look at this. Okay. Chapter 40 talks about what happened with the cupbearer and the baker, right? The Pharaoh got angry with them. And literally it says, I'm going to go to verse 3. It's, or here, verse 2. Pharaoh was angry with the, his two officials. They were officials, see? His two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night. Each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw they were dejected or distraught, disturbed, confused, puzzled, right? So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in, the, in his master's house, why do you look so, so sad today? Then they tell him. And then what happens? Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. Joseph stepped out with radical obedience. These were officials of the Pharaoh. He stepped out boldly to say, hey, I know 
the God of Israel, right? And he's the one who can give you understanding of these dreams. And look what happened because of Joseph's radical obedience. What happened? Two years later, the Pharaoh has these dis disturbing dreams. He's like, ah. And what happens? He calls upon someone to interpret it. Nobody can. Okay, we're going to go to Genesis 41. This is so powerful. I love this so much. Okay. I'm going to scroll down to this very place where the butler talks about Joseph. Okay, here we go. Verse 9 of Genesis 41. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with the servants, and he imprisoned me, and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the Lord, or, or, or excuse me, captain of the guard. We told him our dreams and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position and the other man was impaled. So Pharaoh sent or summoned Joseph. My God, a bold, radical act of obedience will open up doors of greatness for you look at this and even right now what the Lord is saying to me is Joseph had dreams from God about his destiny Joseph opened up excited about it his brothers were jealous all of a sudden he's thrown into a pit all this happens and what does God end up doing uses Joseph to interpret the dreams uses Joseph to interpret these dreams. And so this moment of interpreting these dreams with the knowledge and revelation of the Lord ends up bringing him into his divine destiny. When it was the dreams he had, right? That ended up, he, he, went, he went through adversity, but it was thrusting him into his destiny and so, see, he had a moment of opening up his mouth, and there was adversity, right? But it was, it was all set up by God. Then God, in turn, after all those years in prison, gives Joseph this moment to interpret dreams. And all of a sudden, when he interprets the dreams, and he was right. When he had those dreams before, he was right when he told his brothers. He, he had the interpretation of it. See, here we go. Thank you, Holy the Holy Spirit speaking. See, the gift of the Spirit of God within you will thrust you into your destiny. And so even though Joseph, he opened his mouth and he still, he was gifted by God to interpret dreams. Even though he was broken, he, he was hurt because his brothers sold him into slavery his gift actually thrust him in the right direction of his destiny. Sometimes we don't realize that when we're actually releasing the gift of God, it causes the wind of the Holy Spirit to thrust us in the right direction to the fulfillment of our destiny. And when God thrusts us in the right direction, it's on the threshing floor. It is the crushing. It is all of that that's necessary, right? But it's amazing because he didn't do the wrong thing. There are people that talk about Joseph and they say, oh, he opened his mouth too soon. He did something prematurely, but I disagree. He didn't open his mouth prematurely. He had these amazing encounters and dreams from heaven, from the Lord. He was so excited. Anybody would be excited. And when he began to share the interpretation of it, Oh my gosh, 
that moment caused him to be thrust into the direction of his destiny. Sometimes we don't recognize it. We don't, when things go wrong on purpose. So let's go back to this moment. Pharaoh summons Joseph. Okay. Then verse, let's see. We're, okay. So I'm not going to go into all the dreams, right? I'm just going to go down to this very moment. This is so awesome. Only God would do something this, this wild. Okay. Here we go. After Joseph interprets the dream, Joseph is still flowing in his gift. He's flowing in his gift. And he says, and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They, they should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. All the while, Joseph is clueless. He's operating in his gift. Come on, Joseph is just releasing the wisdom of God, not having a clue that this is actually setting him up for an unbelievable fulfillment of the word of God. Here's Joseph telling the Pharaoh what the Lord is saying. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Verse 37, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the spirit of God? You will know me. They will know you by my spirit. They will know you by my spirit. They might not know me, but they're going to know you by my spirit. Verse 39, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace. And all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Okay. God had Joseph step out with radical obedience, releasing the gift of the Spirit, which was the wisdom of God, the revelation of God. And though the beginning of that experience thrust him into slavery it was all a part of his destiny then all of a sudden he gets this opportunity now to now interpret what the dreams again and this time it's the favor and the blessing of god that blows his mind because he's shocked he's so shocked he has he's not thinking of himself he's walking in his calling Man, you guys better catch this. Joseph is walking in his calling. He's flowing in the spirit, the wisdom of God. He's speaking. He's interpreting the dream through the spirit of God. He's not, he's not thinking anything of, oh my gosh, you know, oh, this is my opportunity. He's clueless. Because he was radically obedient. That was scary. I mean, my God, he's like, oh, I mean, he could have gotten, he, for all he knew, he could have gotten killed. Because he didn't, sir, he didn't worship Pharaoh. But here's a moment. Joseph is honoring his calling. He's honoring the way God mantled him to interpret dreams. And because he speaks the word of the Lord out of obedience, this is what opens the door to forever radically change and transform his life. And he begins to rule and govern a nation and the people with the wisdom and the strategy of God. That is huge. You never know how your radical obedience years ago is going to open a great door of blessing for you now. You don't know. You don't know how the Lord will orchestrate things and set you up 
because you radically obeyed him. Joseph did it, and two years later, there was his moment. He thought he was forgotten. He thought he was literally forgotten. He wasn't forgotten. Okay. Now we're going to go into Moses. Moses taking his staff and slamming it into the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 14, 15 through 18. God tells Moses, he tells him, he commands, take your staff and slam it into the Red Sea. And then I'm going to send my east wind and I'm going to part it. And the people can begin to, to walk across the Red Sea. Because of Moses' radical obedience, meaning he did it immediately. He didn't question it. He didn't do it. He did it. He trusted God. And because of his radical act of obedience, an entire nation was delivered. I cannot... There's no way that I can't be excited. There's no way that I can't be filled with the passion of Christ knowing that a radical act of obedience can deliver a nation for crying out loud. Because the Lord hears the cries aloud of his people. Moses acted immediately. And then God sent his east wind. People think that it was just God that did something. No, he, at, he waited on Moses to respond and obey quickly. And the moment Moses did exactly what looked absolutely foolish to the children of Israel, they get, what is your stick going to do when you slam it in the water, Moses? You look like an idiot. Can you just imagine in our modern day, you're, you're with the people and God says, hey, go get a stick and go slam it into that river. Or oh, just, you know, just something like, think about Moses. The thoughts that might have gone through his head because the people were murmuring and complaining. Tell him, you brought us here to die. We can't stand you. Moses immediately responded. It was a radical obedience, radical obedience to deliver a nation. So powerful. Here we go. Peter stepping out of the boat. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 33. We're going to go there, and then we're going to go to Esther. Okay, we're going to end it with Esther. But Peter stepping out of the boat. We're going to go to Matthew 14 now, verse 22 through 23. I, I just, oh, I'm so stirred in the spirit. How many of you guys are stirred in the spirit right now? This is so powerful. Here we go. I gotta look at some. I gotta look at some comments. Oh, glory to God! Let me see. That's right. You know what? I'm gonna post this real quick. That's right. Freedom and truth. We learn obedience through suffering. That's exactly right. See, we learn obedience, but even obedience just. Random acts of obedience is different than radical obedience. Radical obedience is literally when, I mean, it's, it, it, can, it can jeopardize your reputation. You know, you're uncomfortable. You're, you're put on the spot by God. So it's not something that he's, you know, preparing you for. Radical obedience is when God takes you by surprise. And says, do this right now. Right now. So you didn't. 
It's wild. Okay, here we go. Matthew 14, starting at verse 22. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind that was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. So it was a supernatural encounter. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. There's so much deep revelation in that right there. This is about, if it's you, Lord, lead me by your spirit to step out and do something that is, is absolutely only by your spirit. He said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Peter, that moment was wild. A moment of completely stepping into the spiritual realm. Stepping out of the natural laws of creation and stepping into the glory of God. Everything that is established in the spiritual realm. And he begins to take that radical act of obedience. Because he's thinking, okay, Lord, tell me to go. And then all of a sudden he's like, yep, right now. Step out. And he begins to step out on the sea, which we talk about the sea of glass in the throne room, the sea of revelation, the waves of his glory, everything by the spiritual realm. And he steps out. And when those other disciples see that moment and they witness it, it wrecked them. It wrecked them. A moment to see Peter. All of a sudden he's scared. Now he starts to sink and the Lord pulls him up. But they get to see Peter walking on the water with the Lord. They begin to just, they were so wrecked and they begin to worship the Lord. You have no idea how when God tells you to step out in the supernatural, to move in the spiritual realm, that those who begin to witness your radical act of obedience, they're going to fall to their face and worship the Lord. A, a sense of unbelievable holy reverence and humility. So a radical act of obedience will restore a holy reverence and a holy fear upon the people of God. To worship the Lord, right? In fear and trembling, saying, My, truly you are the Son of God. Well, look at that. How you affect and impact the church. He stepped out. None of the other disciples stepped out. Only Peter stepped out. And when he stepped out, they witnessed a supernatural experience. And it restored a holy reverence. It totally wiped out fear and it brought them into that place to encounter the Lord, to worship him. Think about wherever you may be, even in, involved in any type of ministry and God begins to encounter you. And all of a sudden the Lord tells you to step out 
And because you step out to do what God tells you to do, regardless of how the people will respond, your act of radical obedience will begin to impact the people who witness what you step out to do. For instance, maybe God may say, I want you to step out and I want you to pray over that person that's in a wheelchair. Or I want you to step out and release my healing virtue over that person with that sickness and that disease that's crippled. And all of a sudden, your random act of obedience, immediately responding to the Lord, will cause others to witness something so supernatural that will forever change their lives because it'll change their heart posture. It'll restore their faith, but it'll bring a holy fear and reverence unto God. Witnessing a miracle is not about tallying up numbers to grow a ministry. Witnessing a supernatural miracle is to change the heart posture in the people, in that community, in that vicinity, to come back to a holy fear and reverence before a holy God. Okay, here we go. Last one. Esther. Esther coming unannounced into the courts of the king, knowing that she could be killed, that she could be executed by the order of the king. And we know, right, the protocol... You have to be summoned by the king in order to appear before his court. And what's amazing about this, okay, this radical act of obedience. Some of you guys have seen that One Night with the King, the movie they made uh, many years ago. I think Tommy Tenney was a part of that as well. But the moment that Esther, right, she, she, she hears and, and, and receives the burden coming from Mordecai. And she says, tell the people to fast for three days without food or water. Call them on a fast to pray for me. Because I know that I'm scared. And I know that this could cost my life. I need intercession. Come on. Tell them to intercede for me because I know that this could cost that this could this could cost me my life. And what Esther does, and this is amazing because she ends up getting instruction from the king of kings. So she is receiving a command and instruction from the one true king for her to come unannounced before the courts of the king Xerxes, her husband. And oh my goodness, let's go to Esther chapter 4, 15 and then Esther chapter 8 because this is powerful. Talk about a radical obedience that saved the nation, the Jewish people from being slaughtered, from a genocide. Okay, here we go. Esther chapter 4. It's the best... Oh, man. 15. Okay, Esther chapter 4, verse 15. Let's see, here we go. Or four, Let's see. Here we go. Okay. All right. I'm going to read verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king 
even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Okay. Esther had to step out with radical obedience in that moment to even release that instruction. Like, you do this. I need the people to do this right now. This is vital. This is serious. Okay, and look at, because of her radical obedience, we're going to go to ver Esther chapter 8. Her radical obedience saved a nation. And then blessed and prospered a nation. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to go to the scripture. Here it is. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go to, let's see, where do you want me to go, Holy Spirit? All right, we know, right, that the moment Esther appeared in the courts, that King Xerxes gave her favor and, ha and handed her the scepter and granted her her request to prepare a banquet table, right? For Haman to sit at that table and for her to be there with, with her husband. But I want to go to chapter 8 verse 1. It says this. After that meeting, right? He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That same day King Xerxes, or Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman. <laughs> gave Esther her enemy's estate. The enemy of her people. Her random act of radical obedience. Listen. No, it wasn't random. Excuse me. That's the wrong terminology. Her radical obedience caused her to gain the estate of her enemy. What? What did God tell Abraham? Your descendants will begin to take cities Governed by their enemies. Oh my, positions. Governed by their enemies. Here we go. Look at Esther. Her radical obedience caused her to gain the estate of her enemies. Look at this. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king. For Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring which he had reclaimed from Haman and presented it to Mordecai and Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Okay, now we're going to go down to verse 9 because this is my favorite right here. Okay, here we go. <sighs> ah! At once, the royal secretaries were summoned on the 23rd day of the third month, which is January, March, the month of Sivan, they wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and the satraps, governors, and nobles of 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were written in the script of each province and the language of each people and also to the Jews in their own script and language. Okay. Here's the king's edict. He granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves and to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the provinces of King Xerxes was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. When, and now we're going to go to verse 15. When Mordecai left the king's presence, he was wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold, 
and a purple robe of fine linen, and the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor, all because of a woman who stepped out with radical obedience. That one, that amazing, amazing love story with Esther even her king, there's so much in that. But the focus right now is about her radical obedience to her what? Her bridegroom, her husband, her king, God Almighty. And her radical obedience didn't just save her people, but they were able to be protected, plunder everything from the enemy's land, and they 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 ended up having the greatest celebration and the greatest victory, and a law was established because of her radical obedience. I don't think, whew, I don't think we can really comprehend. What happens when we, we really radically obey God? So you guys, this is the message. This is the word of God tonight. And I truly pray that you guys were so blessed by this word, this Bible study, this in-depth teaching. And I am absolutely praying that you will be so postured before the Lord to say, Father, I thank you that my heart is in the right posture in your presence to absolutely quickly respond when you command or instruct me to do something immediately. That I am in such a state of rest in your presence that I truly that I recognize, number one, how much I trust you. Cultivate a deeper trust in my, in my relationship with you. But that I really can, can, can soak in and digest how much takes place, the harvest, the breakthrough that takes place in the lives of so many others because of my radical obedience. Not just a breakthrough in my life, because the greatest reward is to see how my obedience, my radical obedience, affects the lives of so many others. That's what impacts your heart. You can have a quick moment of if God blesses you financially, if he blesses you in little certain areas. But I'm telling you, my God, what sticks to your heart. What is more valuable to your heart is the way that your radical obedience changes the lives of others. That is the reward. Amongst anything else, that is the greatest. So I pray again that this message really blessed you, really opened up your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears to really receive and I just praise God how the Holy Spirit steps in to the sacred garden of your heart as a gardener that he is. And he begins to really cultivate this message. And then it goes deep. That it goes deep. And that you are blessed. That you are blessed. That you can soak in the Father's presence. Because I'm telling you something that we become depressed. We fall into a deeper depression when our life is bland and boring because we're not moving in the spirit. We were created to move by the spirit of God. And when we're not moving by the spirit of God, it, it, it causes us to feel bored and depressed. And it, it's, it's just unbelievable what we experience.
It's kind of like those symptoms that happen when we're not moving in the spirit. How many of you can say that? You can attest to that. Say, man, I know if, if for like a, a week or something, if I'm completely not connect, connecting and, 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 and pursuing the heart of God and really spending time with the Spirit of God, I can, I just, I can feel the difference. Cause see, man, we we when we're born again, we're born, we're washing the blood, and it's by the Spirit. So now we're we have this amazing covenant in with in the, with the Spirit of God, and so we only feel alive when we're really moving with His Spirit. So I pray if that's you, if you if you feel spiritually stagnant and stuck, and you've been like, God, I just feel bored and ugh. This is where you got to check and go, wait a minute. I got to really connect with the Lord. Say, Holy Spirit, I want to commune with you. I want to break bread with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to have an ex a, a fresh experience with you that just sets my heart on fire again, that makes me feel alive again. Come on, that really encourages my heart, that lifts my spirit. I want to have a fresh encounter with you. I want to go on a new adventure with you, whether you just open up the opportunity if I'm going grocery shopping, if I'm with my friends, if I'm at work, whatever, wherever you want to do it, when you want to do it. But Lord, I need a fresh experience with you because that's what makes me feel alive. I'm telling you, it just takes that one encounter. It takes that one encounter. Now, I want to tell you guys that um, I believe next week, so this, this next Wednesday at 5, I believe the Lord is going to release me to release a very powerful message based on an actual encounter that I have with the Lord on day 3 of my water fast. And let me tell you something. I went into travail and boy, did Jesus go to a deep place in me, healing a place in me that was so deep and so life changing that when I got out of that encounter and that experience with Jesus, that immediately I knew that this is connected to the remnant of God, that this is something that God is doing in this season that is going to bring such a depth of healing because of where we've all had to be with God, we, where we've all had to, to stay waiting on the Lord. And so there's something amazing that the Lord's going to have me release. And it's really going to be a word through this encounter that's going to bring a depth of healing that you didn't even recognize that you need in this season and i'm telling you what i know this is for the remnant and it humbles me you know there's encounters that are just for you and the lord but then there are moments that god lets you know this is not just for you i took you into this moment but it's now going to become an outflow to my people to my set apart ones glory to god so i'm excited about that and also, guys, I'm going to be posting some information um, this week. I'm going to be posting some information on one-on-one -on -one coaching and counseling. And the Lord told me to say this, so I'm going to say it. The type of coaching and counseling that I do is not random stuff that you see in the Christian church. The type of coaching and counseling that I do is such a deep dive of prophetic mentorship it is high level coaching and counseling. It is only for those that recognize, oh my God, I'm serious. I'm serious about my covenant with God. I'm serious about my surrender to my calling. And I need some direction and I may need to go through some healing. I need some uh, to gain deeper understanding and wisdom concerning where I'm at right now in my life. I'm telling you, so I am finally opening these doors and I'm going to make a post soon 
so that you guys can see it and then you can comment if you know by the spirit Say, oh my goodness, you know what? I know this is for me. You're going to know it by the Holy Spirit. I'm praying that you know it. And here's the other thing too. Finances are not going to be an issue for you. You are going to recognize how incredibly valuable you are and how much you need that journey that it's not going to even be an issue. Because here's the thing. Whatever God calls you to do, he provides. Have you ever heard that saying, if it's God's will, it's God's bill? If it's God's will, he's going to open up the storehouse of heaven and he's going to give you what you need. He's going to show you, he's going to open the doors because he knows you're serious and you've given him your yes. Because you recognize, I got a calling that's bigger than me. And I know I have to seriously commit to it. And I need the right mentorship. So you guys know me. You know how the Holy Spirit ministers through me. And I've got testimonials I'm going to be um, posting as well. So you guys can hear from others who have experienced those type of journeys with me. And it's really changed their lives. It's really deeply changed their lives. And it's all because, not because of Kelly. It is because of the mantle on Kelly. It is because of the counsel and the coaching that comes from the Holy Spirit that is within me. Hallelujah. That's important to understand. So guys, I love you. Thank you so much for joining. Praise the Lord for what he poured out for all of us tonight. And if you want to email me, if you want to share your story with me, if you have prayer requests, whatever the case may be, or if you have questions on my mentorship journey, email me at the Cimarron tribe at gmail.com. That contact info is in the description of this broadcast. And if the Lord wants you to partner, I'm praying for partners for the Cimarron tribe. I want you to be prayerful about it. Okay. I only want true warriors in Christ in the community of the Cimarron tribe who really value what God is doing in this ministry, who understand the importance of what God is doing in this ministry. So I want you to prayerfully seek the Lord if he wants you to partner, because I don't want just random people doing that. I want people that really value what God is serving at his table here. Okay. Don't do it. If you're asking, Oh, I just need all this. I want all this stuff in my life. So I just want to partner financially. No, I don't want that. I want you to partner because you recognize what God is truly pouring out and how God is deeply discipling. And absolutely, God will bless you abundantly, but he's going to bless you in ways that are far beyond your wildest dreams. He's not going to bless you back just financially. He's going to bring encounters in your life. He's going to deposit so many things from heaven in your life that radically advance you where God needs you to be in the kingdom. Okay, it's bigger than that. Finances is just a tool. Finances is simply a tool. The true value is the actual kingdom purpose. That's it. That's the only thing. How many times have you guys heard me say it? Money is made that comes from the bark of a tree. The bark of a tree for crying out loud. That money really has no value. That's just what it is in the civilization of man, what they deem the value of what that paper that actually came from the bark of a tree that was stripped off of a tree trunk comes from. And I could go deeper because the Lord says we're like trees planted by streams of living water. My God. And if bark is, if, if, if money is actually created and comes out of like dollar bills and comes out of the bark that's stripped off of the trunk of the tree and the branch and the wood, all of that, you better think and recognize the real value is you. The real value is of spiritual principles. So always remember, money is not a value. The value of money is the tool that serves the kingdom purpose. The tool that serves a purpose that has value. The purpose is the value. Thank you, Jesus. 
All right, I love you guys. Shalom to every heart and every home in Jesus' name. And I look forward to seeing those of you next week on Wednesday for another deep dive at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. It's going to be a powerful word. And I will go ahead and upload the schedule for that live broadcast this week. Okay? God bless you guys. Love you. Glory to God.